Welcome to California Farm Day. We are excited to have more than 20,000 students throughout California joining us virtually to learn more about getting weather-wise. I'm meteorologist Rob Kralmark. I work for an ABC station in Northern California for the morning news. Well, what does weather have to do with agriculture? Well, it turns out a lot. Take my favorite food, for example, a good old fashioned California burrito. Now, many of the ingredients are found in our food or are grown right here in California. It's the number one state in the country for food and agriculture. Now, the weather greatly impacts how farmers and ranchers produce the 400 different commodities grown right here in the Golden State. Let's hit the farm now, guided by the latest edition of what's growing on newspaper. And now after each presenter, there will be a quick fun fact quiz. We're gonna take it together as a class and see how you're getting weather-wise. Hi students, my name is Elisa Noble and I own Millertown Sheep Farm and we raise sheep and goats here in the Sierra Nevada foothills. You all have your What's Growing On newspaper in front of you. Go ahead and open to page three and we are going to talk about animals and weather. As human beings, we can get too hot or too cold. This is one of the first warm days we've had here, so things are warming up. The animals can also get too hot or too cold. So animals have adapted to withstand hot and cold, but we still as farmers help keep them comfortable in a few different ways. So the sheep have their wool coats, if you will, that they wear throughout the winter. And wool is naturally moisture repellent. And so they often, even if they have the option to go in a shed, will stand out in the rain because they are not getting wet. This time of year, it's getting warm. And so we actually will shear here in about two weeks. And shearing means that basically we give the sheep a haircut. So we can show you a picture of a sheep with its full fleece and then a sheep after it's been shorn. So we do that now because the weather's getting warm and we want them to get rid of that fleece going into the hot summer months. The sheep in the front has her full wool coat. There's about two to three inches thickness of wool there. She will get shorn here in just a couple of weeks and then look like the sheep in the back that has already been shorn. This is the raw wool right off of the sheep when we've given them a haircut. And then we take it to the mill and they clean it and spin it into yarn and we sell this yarn at the farmers market and then of course with yarn you can make things like socks and hats scarves and blankets and lots of other things one thing that's always important to observe with animals is how much and what they are eating and drinking so throughout the winter, when it's not warm and there's lots of moisture in the grass that they're eating, they will drink hardly any water. It's always important that they have water, um, but then this time of year, today I think it's gonna be our first 78, 80 degree day, all of a sudden they are drinking a ton of water. And so that's part of how they're regulating their body temperature and you really need to pay attention and make sure that they always have fresh, clean, cold water available. On days that are warm, especially when the weather is first becoming warmer in the spring, they will start drinking a lot more water. And that's really when it's important to make sure that they always have access to clean, cold water. On other farms, depending on the situation, farmers might use misters, fans, or other ways to keep the animals cool, especially in the hot summer months. Who knew the weather could have such an impact on your food supply? Think about that the next time you're really hot or cold.
Hello and welcome to Cal Expo, home of the California State Fair here in Sacramento, California. It's wonderful to see our water reservoirs filling up. What's even more beautiful is the snowpack lining our mountains. Together with some water conservation measures, we hope that this water will sustain our communities and our state for years to come, keeping us the best agricultural state in the nation. Now it's time for Weather You Know. Hi, Mr. Rob. What's the difference between hail and snow? All right, this is such a good question because uh, it seems similar, right? It's frozen water coming out of the sky. So how different really is hail from snow? Well, it turns out it's a lot different. A hailstone starts off as a droplet of water, a raindrop. It goes up and down in the clouds. It freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws and it gets bigger, 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 but it's hard. It's basically a chunk of ice. A snowflake is different. It starts off as a frozen particle and then grows uh, in the ways that you see here. And it's also soft and it's mostly air. So they are very different. But you know what, we do get into these weird subcategories where you start to see other types of frozen precip, which is somewhere in between hail uh, and also snow. We call this grapple. It's basically what they nicknamed soft hail, but it's a water droplet that starts to grow ice on it as it gets bigger. So there are some other things that are kind of in between hail and snow. Hey there, teachers and students of California. My name is Justin Stoss, owner and chief pilot here at Farm Air Flying Service located in Sacramento, California. Sitting behind me here is an Air Tractor 802 Alpha model. It is powered by Pratt & Whitney PT6-67. Uh, it is the largest production single engine agricultural aircraft in production to this day. And uh, it is pretty awesome. Aviation ties directly in with agriculture in uh, many ways, uh, in a variety of ways. Here I'm going to speak on what they tie into for us here at Farm Air. Uh, our staple crop is rice. Local farmers depend on aviation for many reasons pertaining to farming rice, such as sowing rice by air. So we actually uh, soak seed, load it in these airplanes right here, and uh, sow it over the fields into, into flooded rice fields. Uh, insecticide applications, fung fungicide applications, uh, nutrients being uh, whether foliar or dry fertilizers. Mother Nature plays a big role in the other part of our business. Uh, utilizing aviation isn't always necessary, but Mother Nature sometimes creates a perfect storm which gives us uh, a variety of different applications needed for uh, certain crops. Uh, here recently in February of 2023, uh, leading all the way clear into the first day of April, we had an atmos a bunch of atmospheric rivers that took place and the almond growers couldn't get their fungicide applications on in time and they were heavily dependent on by uh, aircraft to spray the fields because they could not access the fields with their ground rigs and they continued to get storms uh, every so, so many days that the field stayed saturated and some of the acreage, some of the acreage that I take care of, we covered uh, three times, most of it twice. So having a bird's eye view is what a lot of people like to call uh, getting to fly around. So my perspective versus a ground perspective, when we're talking about agriculture, we're, we're typically less than 500 feet above the ground, so we're not necessarily getting up to where maybe some of you have traveled with your parents or on airliners and whatnot. But uh, at the 500 foot mark, my advantage over being on the ground is seeing quality of seeding jobs, uh, seeing disease issues. I can see, you know, the whole field and see the weed patches. So these aircraft are certified for uh, day and nighttime VFR operations. So it's, uh, you gotta have weather decent enough to see uh, in visual conditions. You cannot fly these aircraft uh, in reference to instruments. You'll see your uh, local agricultural operator operating these aircraft, seeding rice in winds up to 25 miles an hour, gusting 30, but we prefer to do work less than 10 miles an hour of wind. That is ideal and a smoother day.
My name is Brian Brown. Um, we're back here at the State Fair and uh, I work at the Water Education Foundation, the Project WET program. And today we're going to be taking a look at an activity that studies plants and the water cycle. How, how, do, how do plants connect to the water cycle? All right, well, come on over here with me. We're going to show you how to set up this activity. This is a Project Wet activity called Thirsty Plants. And the way this is going to work is all you need is a, a plastic bag. And I like to use these, you know, a basic Ziploc or one like this where you can just, the kids can zip. And um, what you're going to do is, students, you're just going to choose any plant on your schoolyard. It could be a kumquat bush like this. It could be grapes. It could be grass. It could be a, any tree. And what you're going to do is work with a partner and very carefully try to get as many leaves together and slide this plastic bag over it without damaging them. Okay, and then you just zip the, zip the bag around it just like we did right here with this demonstration. All right, and then you're going to leave it. And what we're going to do is we're going to see what happens over time. So you might leave it for the end of the period, or maybe your teacher have it uh, stay on for a day for the rest of the day. But you're going to come back at some point, and you're going to carefully open up your bag and take a look and see what you have in it. And you can see in here that we've got a lot of moisture in it. So there's a lot of water that's come into this bag. Um, we basically made made the plant sweat. Okay, but in this case, it, it's a transpiration. We'll get into a little more of what that means in a minute. But this has only been on here for a few hours, and look at how much water we were able to get out of this plant. And it was over just this many leaves. And if I was estimating on this whole little bush right here, this might be only like maybe 5% of the entire tree, say, if I was guesstimating on it. So a little teeny tiny bit, but we got that much water out of it. Um, and so, you know, that is what we're going to do. We're basically going to make plants sweat and then get into, well, why is that, how does that fit with the water cycle and why is that important to know? Teachers out there, you'll be receiving a copy of this activity in your farm day kit. Um, and in the activity, they actually have a diagram in there that you can use with students, but I actually like to ask them, you know, using next generation science standards, it has the students with coming up with how do they think water moves through a plant. So with our demonstration back there, how do you think water got from the roots up through into the leaves? How does it move? And just kind of see what they come up with. And so in here I've got where water is precipitating. It's falling out of the sky, so raining down. Um, it's sinking into the ground, so students may have something like this in there where it's uh, percolating in, if you want to use the scientific words, moving into the roots or absorption, um, which we'll learn about in the um, in, in the uh, Ag in the Classroom paper. And then it comes up through the roots and somehow gets up through the plant and it ends up going up through the stems into the leaves somehow. All right, and so if, if students have something like that, you know, that, that's kind of a you know, decent idea of how, plant, how it moves. And then it, it actually comes out through the leaves, goes back up in the atmosphere, condenses back into a cloud. Okay, so evaporates out, condenses. And so you can see right here, we have a little bit of a water cycle right here, just with the plant. In, in your what's growing on in your um, farm day kit, you have page four in here is all about the water cycle. And you'll see on this page, it's, this kind of looks like our diagram with color that we just did. Here's our plants. You can actually see the water um, evapotranspiration happening. It's going up here in, um, into the clouds. And you can imagine here it is coming back down over here, absorbing into the ground. And then here's the roots down here, back into the plant. So you can see right here how the plants fit into the larger water cycle. Of course, those molecules, they don't have to come straight back down and go back in the plant. They could be going all the way out to the ocean. They could be going down into the ground. They could go into a lake. They could just hang out in the clouds for a while and go to some other country. Um, so the water, the molecules, they travel every which way. And today we just looked at this little teeny part of how do plants fit into this cycle? How does water move through the cycle through a plant? So some important questions for you um, as you're looking at, you know, the water that you captured in the plant is, you know, if, the, if, you have, if the students are old enough, think about that, how much you were able to get in that bag. How much of the plant did you actually have in there and how much water did you get over the time period that your class did this? So if you had to think about it, how much water do you think actually could move through that entire plant in a day? How much can each plant uh, evaporate off into the atmosphere? Um, and does that matter? Um, think about how much water it takes to grow some of your favorite um, um, food crops like tomatoes or grapes or kumquats, these things that we were just taking a look at today. 
Um, think about how much water it takes to grow some of the redwood trees that maybe are in your yard or other trees that you have in there. And do different plants transpire at different rates? So your students, you know, as you went out and you, you bag plants, which ones kicked out more water, which ones had less? Um, and could you actually come up with a way to conserve water by changing out some of the plants in your schoolyard? So there's all, it's, you know, plants are a very important part of the water cycle. We're going to take a look at exactly how water moves up through a, a plant that has, um, it's a vascular plant. So kind of like us, we have blood vessels and veins. Uh, plants have little tubes that run through them that help carry water instead of blood. And so to take a look at this, these vessels in the case of uh, carrying water are called xylem. All right, and this little model I put together here is just a, a you know, a gift gift paper tube right here, and I stuffed a bunch of little straws in there. That's kind of what it looks like on a smaller level inside of a plant. All these little tubes in here that are helping a, um, channels that help carry water up through the plant. And the way this process works, say like in a tree, like our our uh, little uh, kumquat back here, the molecules they they go up through the plant. Mo water molecules they stick to each other. And so as they go up through the plant, um, they, they get up in there and they're being pulled because water up near the top in the leaves, sunlight is heating the leaves and they basically turn the, essentially turn the vapor and they evaporate. And as they basically go into the steam stage and go off into the air, it, it acts kind of like a vacuum or kind of like you sucking on a straw and the next water molecule is pulled up and it gets heated up and it disappears and the next one gets pulled up and it gets uh, heated up and disappears. And that's essentially what's happening. The sun is as it evaporates water off near the um, out of the leaves. It puts pressure on the rest of the plant to basically suck up water. So what, the molecules are sticking to each other and as one goes up and disappears, the next one just keeps taking its place. Um, and so this process of as it moves through a plant is called transpiration, but then it's evaporation at the top. It's sunlight that's evaporating off. So you'll often hear uh, professionals or farmers, they'll be referring to this as evapotranspiration. It, well, we have redwood trees out here at the state fair. A good sized redwood tree can kick out anywhere from 250 to 500 gallons of water in one day. A lot of water can go through a plant like that. Hey, Mr. Rob, how do you predict the weather a few days from now? So how do you know what's going to happen with the weather? Well, really, it's very, very simple. It's one of the easiest things we do in science. All you have to do is plug in numbers to this, and then you're done. <laughs> this is called the omega equation. It has everything to do with physics. If you have good numbers going into this, you're going to have a good forecast. The problem is, is that it's really tough to get everything accurate in the beginning. Computers crunch all the numbers and then you get an end result, which is called a computer model. That's what you're looking at behind me. The problem with every computer model and every time we crunch the numbers and run them out through the future in time, they're always off just a little bit. That little part that's off gets exaggerated over time. And then by the end of it, it's something usually very different than where you start. However, it's the best place to start and they're getting better every year. Hi, my name is Michael Pequeño. Uh, we're in Dixon, California. Uh, we grow tomatoes for processing, uh, bell peppers, uh, cantaloupes, corn, alfalfa, uh, grains, beans, all kinds of stuff. All right, so this is a Caterpillar Challenger. It's a 765C, has about 305 horsepower. Um, as you can see, it doesn't have your typical tires, rims, stuff like that, wheels. It has tracks. Uh, that gives you a little bit more traction and at the same time gives you flotation. It weighs about a little bit over 30,000 pounds. And this is uh, pretty much what we use to work our ground and rip it up and get it ready for the following year. We use tractors in agriculture because they're easier to maintain than horses and you don't have to feed them every day.
Well, you gotta put diesel, but you can do that every morning, no problem. Tractors are very helpful and for the weather, like last year for tomato harvest, we got this three inches of rain in September, which we shouldn't have got. Um, usually it rains a little bit here and there, but three inches is a lot. And we couldn't get through the field filling up the tomato tubs, the trailers, because the tractors, the smaller tractors, were just getting stuck. They would just start spinning wheels and that was it, you got to pull them out. So we started using these, or better, bigger tractors. They got more traction, they're heavier, they got more horsepower, so we, could, we were able to get harvested. We, we were able to harvest all our acreage of tomatoes. I do check the weather every day. That's the first thing I check in the morning before anything. I know these youngsters like to put or like to see Instagram and Facebook and whatnot. I check weather. I have four different apps. I go into the National Weather Service and I look at this. I look at wind, moist, uh, you know, moisture in the air, everything. So heat waves coming or windy days. I do check the weather pretty often. Here our tractor, we have a cab. Most of our tractors have cabs, some don't. All of them have lights and, and stuff like that to, to work at night, early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, it's still dark. This particular one has GPS, so once you set it on the line, you just push a button, let go of the steering wheel till you get to the end, turn around, push it again. I'd rather drive a tractor than be stuck in traffic. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Rob. When it rains, why does the temperature get warmer? You know, I love this question because it's one of those that it, that is the opposite of what you think. Why does it get warmer when it rains? You know, when we have a storm, we think of it being cold, but actually, a lot of times, especially in the winter, the temperature will come up it's because the air is more moist. There's more water in the air. And just so you know, it takes a long time to warm up water. For example, on a warm, sunny day, 84 degrees, no problem, but that water will always be cold. It just takes a lot longer for that to happen. And here's the other thing that's going on as well. On a normal day, the sun rays come in, hit the ground, and then at night, you we cool off. All that radiation goes back out into space. But when it rains, we get a lot of cloud cover. So what happens is that the warmer temperatures from the day drift up, they hit that cloud layer, and the clouds actually bounce it back down. So it retains a lot of heat. It acts like a blanket. So that's another reason why when it rains, it's actually usually a little bit warmer than you think. Howdy kids, I'm Matt Stone, assistant winemaker and vineyard manager at Lone Buffalo Vineyards out here in beautiful Auburn, California. Wine comes from grapes, and grapes grow in vineyard rows. And in between these vineyard rows, grass grows. So we use sheep as four-legged lawnmowers to cut that grass in between the vineyard rows. So these sheep cut the grass by eating the grass and chomping it with their teeth. So fun fact, kids, sheep only have teeth on the bottom of their mouths. On the top, it's just a gum. So how they eat is they rip and then they chomp. In your What's Growing On, if you turn to page 14, you will find a section on extreme weather events. One thing that it references is wildfires. Wildfires are a major problem in California, and this last year it burned 4.2 million acres across the state. So behind me, we have this beautiful, luscious green pasture. We had an abundance of rain this winter and we're heading into the spring, lots of sunshine, so it's really taking off and growing really thick and full. As it gets warmer, if this grass doesn't have enough water, it's gonna start to brown and kind of turn, turn from these beautiful green hues into a much lighter tan and then a brown. As these grasses turn brown and dry out, what we're worried about is the potential fire risk. So fire can spread through anything that is dried. So we're utilizing sheep and goats and other animals as four-legged lawnmowers that A, utilize that to provide themselves with nutrients, but also prevent 
any potential fire risks in the future. We choose to utilize sheep rather than mechanical means like tractors and mowing because this is their natural diet and if we can put them in an environment where they can utilize that, A, that's great for them, B, tractors have more of an impact on the environment than sheep do, so it's much more a lighter footprint, so to speak, and C, they're able to work with nature to cycle nutrients through the ecosystem by eating the grass and then returning it via their fertilizer into the soil. So students, next time you see a fire engine, know that we have four-legged critters that are also our firefighters on the floor, reducing fuels and keeping California safe. Mr. Rob, how much does the air weigh? Annette, you've got a great question. And I think a lot of people may not realize this, but you are in fact right. Air, as we know it, does in fact have weight. You take a balloon, uh, if it's empty, it will weigh less than a filled balloon. So we know that it has weight to it, but what really is weight? Well, weight has to do with mass and gravity. Mass is just stuff, and we know that air has that because uh, what blows your hair when it's windy? It can move things because it's made up of physical uh, molecules of oxygen, of nitrogen, and other gases as well. But it gets a little bit more tricky trying to measure this because as you go up in the atmosphere, there's still air, but it has less mass because the gravity's the same. The best way to try and figure out exactly what's going on with the air is called pressure. That's how much it weighs down on you. Hello students, my name is Deborah Olson and I, my family's been growing cherries for 123 years in the Santa Clara Valley. Students, have you ever seen a cherry tree before? In back of me is a cherry tree. However, this poor cherry tree is a little on the older side. Also, I believe it's been impacted by the drought that we had for the last three years. And so it has suffered a great deal. It doesn't look as vibrant as, per, as this, um, these limbs that we uh, cut off this morning in Sunnyvale uh, to show you uh, the process once the winter chill, when winter's finished and we get into the springtime. However, it's been so bloody cold this year that the poor trees just stayed dormant. They were sleeping. When, when people talk about dormancy, it means that they're sleeping, like a bear's hibernating, same, same thing. So finally, it started warming up, and so it starts to bloom. Typically, they'd be all looking like this, all leafed out. And if you could see, there's a couple cherries already coming out of here. The, um, they're absolutely beautiful when they're all in uh, full bloom. Uh, obviously, now they're coming out to leaf, and we're hoping that all these are going to stick. Uh, and be, become cherries for you all to enjoy. Cherries are a stone fruit. They're healthy, they're good for you, so don't forget about that aspect of it. So I know you have been talking about what's growing on all day long. Well, we're gonna try to tackle this question. How does it go from summit to stone fruit? Well, I'm sure a lot of you have realized how much snow there is up in the Sierras, which has probably the most snow in the entire United States at this point. And so you want to know how, how does the water affect the cherries? Well, again, we are lucky this year because we're not going to get in this situation like this poor tree who was just dying of thirst these last three years. Now that the water is going to be melting from the Sierras, from the snow, it's going to come down into the mountains and into the reservoirs, the creeks, the rivers, the aquifers, going to fill up the wells for the farmers to farm their cherries and other stone fruits and every other part of agricultural needs. And of course, it's going to allow us consumers to enjoy the uh, water and have a little bit less restriction. But keep in mind, 
Water is a valuable commodity. We want to keep it, keep conserving. I'm here in Sacramento to prepare for you a cherry salsa. A little difference and a tomato salsa, but very similar. Very simple. It'll take you 15 to 20 minutes. We're going to have one cup of cherries. We're going to have two tablespoons of lime juice, a jalapeno pepper that I'm going to cut and uh, take the seeds out. And depending on if your guests like it hot, you keep the seeds uh, in the salsa or you take the seeds out. I'll take the seeds out because it's very, very hot. So I'm going to use two tablespoons of shallots and two tablespoons of uh, basil, cilantro, a uh, half a teaspoon of brown sugar, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, and a little bit of pepper. And then we have the cilantro. Next, we have the shallots. Last ingredient is this nice hot jalapeno pepper. You can leave all the seeds in if you want, or take them out. All right, now I'm going to add the salt and pepper, which is a, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and a little bit of pepper, half a teaspoon of brown sugar. Okay, I'm going to mix this with the lime juice. That's about one and a half limes. Isn't that pretty? Nice contrast the red and the green and the purple. Hey Rob, why do clouds turn gray when they get heavier? Okay, this is a great question, yet once again, as sunlight comes in from the sun, it is white light, and when it hits something, it scatters in all directions, it appears white. There's no big surprise there, but I think what's interesting, as you mentioned, the heavier clouds, meaning the thicker ones with maybe even some rain, they're sort of dark at the bottom, and the reason why, it's just like shade. It just can't penetrate as much. In fact, you can see the same thing, light clouds and dark clouds all within the same area. Notice at the bottom though, the light can't get all the way through. So it's just a cloud that has some shade thrown on it. Hi everybody, I'm Topher Chan. I farm pears in the Sacramento Delta. So in agriculture, weather is one of our biggest challenges. It's actually one of the only ones that we have absolutely no control over. So. Recently, you probably noticed all of, the rain, all of the rains, all the wet weather that we've had. Well, for us as pear growers, that's made it extremely difficult for us to get in the orchards for timely applications of fertilizer and fungicides. When it's really, really, really hot, you know, during the, during the summer months, that's when our fruit's ripening and trying to get it ready for market. And if it's way too hot, our trees and our fruit have a very difficult time maturing and producing sugars at the right levels um, so that we can deliver a really good product to you kids out there. Before you get a pear, it starts with the flower. Typically in early spring is when the pear trees start to bloom, right around the middle of March. And as time goes on, you'll go from a little flower like this, and once you see that little red blush, you know you got a pear. It's ready to go. This is what a pear looks like on the tree. And this is what it looks like when it's ready to go into a fruit cup or a can. If it's a very, very cold and wet spring, pollination is definitely going to be set back and disease pressures are really, really high. So that's going to lead to a loss in reduction or a loss in production and also just a loss in overall tree health. Now, if it's also really, really hot during the bloom, 
a lot of this pollen can actually burn off and you won't get good pollination for the rest of the trees. You may think that all plants and trees are, are pollinated by bees, such as the case with cherries, as you've seen, and almonds. However, with pears, they're self-fertile or wind-pollinated. Now, to ensure that, a lot of growers typically plant different varieties um, throughout an orchard. So it's like us, we grow strictly Bartlett pears, but usually about one tree per acre is of a different variety. In your What's Growing On, I want you guys to turn to page three, and we're gonna look at Just Chill. Just Chill has a lot to do with chill hours. So lots of stone fruits, pears, apples, palm fruits, need a certain amount of chill hours. So that means a certain amount of time below 45 degrees. During this time, it gives the, uh, gives the trees a good chance to get um, a lot of good rest. Um, just like you guys, if you don't get a good night's rest, the next day, kind of sluggish and tired, not at your best. Trees, the exact same way. Adequate chill hours. In pairs, we like anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500. That's gonna help promote an even and timely bloom, um, really good leaf formation, and overall tree health. That's gonna lead to a really good product for you guys and everybody else. Thank you so much for joining us for California Farm Day. A special thanks to all our presenters and thank you for bringing agriculture into the classroom.